basic synopsis of Army of the Dead sounds awesome. We're basically talking Ocean's Eleven meets Dawn of the Dead, so what could possibly go wrong? From its bloated runtime, idiotic characters, lack of character development or sense of urgency, its genre confusion, failure to live up to its premise, the countless wayward plot points, and everyone's refusal to use a weapon suppressor, chances are, like me, you probably came away from this one feeling a little disappointed, especially considering Snyder's Dawn of the Dead remake was such a triumph. There are plenty of interesting ideas in Army of the Dead. Undead tigers and smart zombies that feel emotions, reproduce and form a social hierarchy. Dieter is an amazing character, so much so that a prequel movie featuring him called Army of Thieves was just released, revealing that he too is a budding YouTuber. Is it like in a movie film where each one of us has a different skill set and it's only working together that we can pull off that which needs the pulling off? Yes. There are also hints at extraterrestrial virus origins, blink and you'll miss them robot zombies, and time loop theories, but these hints to a wider and more complicated universe are never explored further, despite being the most fascinating part of the story. There's a weird, super fun world, and especially if you put zombies into that equation, you end up with a really amazingly fun, but also frighteningly real picture. Snyder's influence over this film surpasses his previous projects, with him writing, directing, producing, and working as a film cinematographer. While this level of control makes it the ultimate Snyder experience, it comes with one very clear problem. Nobody was ever there to shoot down some of the wayward ideas and help him organize the structure of the narrative. The film opens to a distracted, newly married couple in a car filled with explosives, crashing into a military convoy, launching its zombie cargo onto the road and kickstarting the outbreak. Not only should have these soldiers seen the car, given how bright its headlights were, but their job is to protect the cargo and intercept any trouble, making their decision to swerve out of the way infuriating. And this touches on one of the major problems throughout, where constantly introduced to characters, they keep making dumb mistakes to progress the plot and facilitate their deaths. Martin. Don't talk to me. I don't trust any of these people, but especially you. I don't trust you to have our backs if shit goes bad. I've been watching you, and you're up to something. Gotcha, bitch. Following this, the military rush in to quell the outbreak, but are overwhelmed, forcing wide-scale evacuations and the installation of a wall to keep the infected in. The offbeat opening credits that chronicle the fall of Las Vegas effectively show us how dire the situation was, and what some of the main characters were doing during the outbreak, all set to a cover version of Viva Las Vegas. Only problem is that we're not back in Vegas until almost an hour into the movie, and this opening sequence is the most fun we'll have for the next two and a half hours. We pick back up a few years later with our hero Scott Ward, a former soldier that saved the Secretary of Defense and many others during the outbreak, now flipping burgers in a diner. With the government set on nuking Las Vegas in a few days, Scott is approached by casino owner Bly Tanaka, who explains that there's $200 million stashed in his vault that he wants recovered before the city is turned to rubble. The money is already insured, meaning Tanaka had already been compensated, but if Ward succeeds, he can keep $50 million to split between him and his squad. Intrigued. Don't give me an answer. Think on it for the night. We'll talk soon, Mr. Ward. Accepting, Ward quickly assembles his team, bringing in fellow mercenaries Maria Cruz and Vanderhoe, helicopter pilot Peters, safe cracker Dieter, and YouTube sharpshooters Mikey Guzman, Chambers, and Damon, all of whom quite literally say, You son of a bitch! I mean! Reducing the often legendary heist trope of assembling the team into a five minute exercise of banality. We also have Tanaka's double-crossing head of security, Martin, Lily, a zombie hunter and quarantine smuggler, abusive security guard, Bert, and even Scott's daughter, Kate, arguably one of the most annoying characters to ever exist. No, you listen. I'm going in either way. I can either go in with you and you can keep me safe, or, okay. or I'll just sneak in after you. And I'll probably die. Kate is still pissed off with Ward, who's been distant after stabbing her infected mother in the brain during the outbreak, and she, despite having no skills but a black belt in belligerence, wants to get into the city to rescue her friend Gita, who was smuggled into the quarantine zone by Lily. Interestingly, as Tanaka runs through their mission, we see them carrying it out on the screen, leading many to speculate that what we see here is actually an alternate timeline, where the heist is a success, tying into some radical notions proposed later in the film. Is it another team or is it us, Dieter? Think about it. Us. I mean, look at him. It could be us in another timeline. And we're caught in some infinite loop. After hearing the mission outline, Damon, arguably the most sensible member of the group, walks out of the heist. 
This is crazy. You all are gonna die. So 50 minutes in and we're finally ready to get back to Vegas with Wards 11. We've established a tight escape from New York style situation with a nuke ready to drop on the city. And we even have a getaway vehicle stashed on top of the casino tower, just like Snake Plissken's glider. How you feeling? It's insane, you know that, right? What if it's a choice between dying on the strip and spending another day flipping patties at the Lucky Boy? I'll gamble on a few million. The film clearly juggles two genres, the zombie horror and the heist caper, while never quite getting the core of either right. When our crew first encounters the zombies, they are not a threat. The shamblers lie dormant, the alphas accept the live human body sacrifice in exchange for safe passage, and we see the ferocious Valentine letting them pass. There's no conflict, which is a basic requirement for any story. Because of this, with the exception of Martin's first betrayal leading to the death of Chambers, a death that could have been avoided, hashtag justice for Chambers, there is no real danger or sense of urgency until an hour and 40 minutes into the film, with Martin's second and third betrayals. And then as a heist film, Army of the Dead falls on its face. There are give or take two key points of tension that make a heist enjoyable. The relationships between the team members to each other and their conflict with the antagonist. Then you have the heist itself, most often presented as one final job where the characters can exercise their specialized skills to either gain some kind of freedom or grant themselves a better life. First off, the team aren't a unit with complex relationships and specialized skills geared towards a heist, but cliques that have been rounded up. They don't have much of a relationship to each other or the amazing antagonist Zeus until the final 15 minutes. And even then, it's not because of anything they did, but something Martin does. In this way, Martin is made out to be the true antagonist. Only problem is that this doesn't work in the structural sense, as he's not someone that the characters are actually struggling against. Both Zeus and Martin don't complement our hero Ward. Bad writers often mistakenly think of the antagonist as a character that needs to look or sound evil, or just do evil things. Instead, we have to approach the antagonist structurally, in terms of how they function in the story being told. In John Truby's The Anatomy of Story, he addresses this issue by saying, A true opponent not only wants to prevent the hero from achieving his desire, but is competing with the hero for the same goal. If you give your hero and opponent two separate goals, each one can get what he wants without coming into direct conflict, and then you have no story at all, which is precisely the case here. Zeus and Ward have no direct conflict that drives the narrative, making the final fight feel empty. And Ward doesn't even know that Martin had been continuously betraying them until the last five minutes of the film. Everyone can do with a few million dollars, so we understand their motivations, but the entire heist is then also revealed to be pointless. The team were promised 50 million dollars in loot in return for breaking into the vault and taking the 200 million, but the casino is owned by Tanaka, who has access to the key codes, meaning there was never any need to waste time cracking the vault. Arriving at the casino, they split up. Scott and Kate find power, Peters preps the helicopter, Lily and Martin keep watch outside, and the rest go with Dieter to the vault. With Martin revealing to Lily that he was actually hired to get an Alpha's head as it was worth 10 times more than what was in the vault and that he would betray the group unless she helped him, he and Lily incapacitate the Queen and take her head. But this begs the question, if the true objective was to collect the head of the Queen, why didn't Tanaka task them with this instead? Considering she literally presented herself at the entrance, they could have made it in and out in under 10 minutes. The heist was pointless. If I can open it, it will be either destruction or renewal. Rebirth. That's heavy, brother. Nevertheless, back at the now redundant vault, Dieter and co make it past a bunch of elaborate traps and begin cracking it open without a sense of urgency. They all start engaging in leisurely conversations and declarations of love, not to mention the time spent discussing time loops by philosophy graduate Vanderhoe that ironically lead nowhere. They talk. Wait, you think that's why I haven't been talking to you all these years? Well, Seem like the seem like the logical assumption, yeah. And talk. I just thought that maybe I thought I fucked that up. And talk. Which would cause the bombing to be postponed indefinitely. The administration has made the dramatic choice to that kid has that safe open yet? Even when the blast has moved forward from one day away to within the hour. While everyone is wasting time, Zeus finds the Queen's body and begins to rally the troops for an all-out assault on the casino, quickly overwhelming the team. Meanwhile, after betraying the team once again, Martin makes off with the Queen's head, but that doesn't work out too well for him. Yeah, 
Despite the chaos, Kate thinks it's the perfect time to try and locate her friend and creeps off into Zeus's headquarters. Her heart is in the right place, but her mind is empty. In the end, as a result of her actions, everyone that was left dies and she's forced to shoot her infected father. Ridiculously, in the epilogue, Vanderhoe then climbs out of the vault with millions in cash, walks through the radiated wasteland and makes his way to the nearest airport to hire a private plane. As his plane begins to land in Mexico City, he finds a bite mark on his arm, kickstarting another outbreak. And let's just leave the fact that Vanderhoe 1 didn't notice his bite, and 2 took hours to turn into a zombie, when others, including Ward, who was also bitten by Zeus, turned in minutes. Combine the consistent lack of motivation, lack of consistency and conflict, ridiculous pacing, circumstances and decision making of the characters, in addition to the anticlimactic ending, it's hard not to feel shortchanged. Quote the great Joseph Campbell, he said, it is by going down into the abyss where we recover the treasures of life. Where you stumble, there lies your treasure. To the ironic twist of the unknown. Watching this again, I also couldn't help but feel as though Snyder spent most of the movie remaking Aliens. <laughs> Just tell me one thing, Burke. You're going out there to destroy them, right? That's the plan. All right, I'm in. Yes? Mr. Tanaka, I'm in a tough spot. I don't like you very much. So I hate giving you the satisfaction of taking the job, but... You know, Burke, I don't know which species is worse. You don't see them fucking each other over for a goddamn percentage. At least within these walls, the rules are clear. You don't see them fucking each other over. Seriously, Army of the Dead follows James Cameron's movie almost beat for beat. Burke! Open this door! Burke! Open! Oh, no, no! <laughs> You always were an asshole, Gorman. The problem with quoting and copying films like Aliens, Ocean's Eleven, and even Escape from New York so flagrantly is that we're constantly reminded of better movies. I know that following allegations made against former cast member Chris DeLeo, Snyder was forced to do reshoots, completely replacing his character with a performance by Tignataro that was VFXed in, and a lot of scenes had to be removed, which is why it often feels disjointed. But it also feels like Snyder wanted to do way too much in terms of story, and in the literal sense of him being the screenwriter, producer, director, and cinematographer. And his worst auteur impulses took over as the movie went on. The result is a movie full of contradictions. It goes for epic, but feels totally empty. It's flippant, but too self-serious. And it attempts to be innovative, while shamelessly ripping off some classics. After all the setup and all the promises, by the end of the movie, we're left with nothing but disappointment. Fuck. Well, that's all for today, folks. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit like and subscribe to stay up to date on all my content. And uh, yeah, if you have any other suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.